In today's Chalk Talk, we're going to talk about something exciting and dynamic, something with high-frequency oscillators, fancy frequency response calculations, Q factors, high-efficiency operation, cutting-edge performance. That's right, baby. We're discussing DC. Wait, what? Uh, Amelia, DC is boring. Constant voltage, steady signals, not much to talk about, a 1.2 volts, flatline, done, end of story. Thank you for watching. Ah, but what if you want to convert from one DC voltage to another, and do it very efficiently, and end up with a nice, precise, steady DC over a wide range of load applications? Hmm? Tricky, huh? Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Today we're going to take a fascinating journey into the world of DC to DC conversion with an LLC resonant mode controller. My guest is Sam Abdel Rahman from Infineon. And, well, roll up your sleeves, put on your propeller beanie, fire up MATLAB, and let's get cracking. It's going to be a crazy ride in converter land. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that you can click that link. There you can download several application notes that further expand on this topic. Welcome, Sam. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Amelia. Okay, so I understand we're going to be designing some switching power supplies today, and you're going to convince me that LLC is the way to go. So, Sam, what's so special about this topology? Okay, LLC is getting a big attention in the power supply arena for too many reasons. But to answer your question, let me show you first the concept of resonant conversion and specifically one simple example of this. So in resonant converters, we have a switching bridge generating a voltage pulse and that voltage pulse excites resonant tank mm -hmm. and creating a sinusoidal current, yeah. a primary circuit. And that primary resonant or sinusoidal current get transferred and scaled to a secondary side rectifier and then filtered by the output capacitors. And that's a basic conversion from DC to DC in a resonant fashion. Okay. Now, what's special about LLC resonant converter is the current is always start with the reverse polarity in the primary switches or MOSFETs, and that's what creates the zero voltage switching. Similarly, on the secondary side rectifiers, each diode has a half wave sinusoidal waveform, and it starts and ends at zero. Okay. So the main benefit of a resonant converter is a soft switching on the primary and the secondary side as well. Okay. Knowing this simple explanation, if we compare it to a soft switching topology like mm -hmm. the phase shift full bridge, which is also a widely used in SMPS applications, and especially for a higher power, because it has the inherent soft switching capability and almost required in every application with a high density requirement and high efficiency requirement. Mm -hmm. Now, if I compare LLC versus a phase shifted full bridge, yeah. the LLC is a full resonant converter. And just what I showed in a previous slide, it achieves a soft switching on the primary and the secondary side devices. And also, the soft switching is not load independent. And we can mm. see that later on that even at light load, the LLC can maintain the soft switching, and that uh, gives high efficiency at light load regions. In terms of the cost, the LLC could be implemented with uh, lower power components, uh, lower count, mm -hmm. and also could be implemented with different circuits on the primary and secondary side, like a half bridge and a full bridge, and also on secondary could be different kind of rectifiers. And that's could cover a wide area of applications and power ranges. Mm -hmm. Now, if you ask me, you know, those benefits has a price and the yeah. price is drawbacks. The main drawback is the challenging in the design ah. and the controller schemes and protection of the topology. It's a variable frequency operation, meaning mm -hmm. that the voltage regulation or modulating the gain of that circuit is commanded by modulating frequency. Okay, so you've already showed us the concept, but let's walk through some of the details and how this LLC converter works. Yes. Now, if we look at that circuit and 
showing the way it modulates gain as a function of frequency, uh -huh. the gain from input to output is basically the gain of the switching bridge mm -hmm. and then multiplied by the gain of the resonant tank okay. and then multiplied by the transformer turns ratio. Okay. Now, the bridge gain and the transformer turns ratio are fixed components. Mm -hmm. The only variable gain is my resonant tank voltage gain. And that's a function of three parameters as shown in the equation, Q, M, and Fx. Q is a term that's the quality factor, and that changes as a function of the load. So ah, okay. a high load means I have a high Q value. Okay. So as my output current changes, my resonant tank gain also would change. Okay. M is a design parameter that relating the total primary inductance mm. to the resonance inductance. M is equal to LR plus LM over LR. LM is the magnetizing inductance of the transformer in this case. And M here is a design parameter that I fix as a part of the design, mm. but does not change with the operation. Ah, okay. And then FX is what we call the normalized switching frequency. And it's equal to the switching frequency divided by the resonant frequency. FX or a switching frequency is my control parameter. That's what the controller command the bridge or the resonant tank frequency in order to achieve the voltage regulation required. Okay, so do we have to build one of these on the desk here or can I just plug this right into MATLAB and see how it performs? Yeah, very good question, Emilia. And this is back to the point why this converter is more challenging in the design. Yeah. So given that gain equation, you need to take that in a software like a MathCAD or MATLAB Okay. And if you look at the curves in this slide, you will see the plot of different gains with the switching frequency for different Q curves. Yeah. This is a, somehow a complex procedure to relate frequency to the gain by just a simple hand calculation. You need something to draw in a software, as you mentioned. Yeah. Further, if we want to explain those curves, each of those curves represent a load value, or in other word, a Q value. Yeah. So if you look at the red one, this is a condition where I have a light load operation. And as I go to a lower curves, that's where my output load is getting heavier or higher currents. One concern here is each load has its own peak value. And to the right of the peak, that's where I define an inductive operation and to the left of that peak is my capacitive operation. Okay, yeah. Now, one design condition, if I operate at any of these curves, is I must stay in the inductive region. Right. And the capacitive region, in this case, as shaded, is prohibited to fall into for other reasons. Yeah. So I always want to design on the right side of the peak, right? You got it. And we want to stay out of that capacitive zone on the left. Why is that? Yes, very good question. In the capacitive region, what happens is the current is lagging the voltage, mm. meaning on the primary side, the current on the body diode or the intrinsic body diode of the MOSFET will have a hard commutation. Mm. And that reverse recovery could cause a damaging or a failure condition on the primary MOSFETs. Gotcha. Um, and another reason is why I, I must stay in the inductive region because the inductive region is same thing, where my current is leading the voltage and that what caused my zero voltage switching before I turn on the gate of that MOSFETs. Gotcha. And this is the main benefit of that topology is we want to get the zero voltage switching. Right, okay. So if I just take one Q curve, how does the frequency regulation behave or work in this topology? Yes, so if we look at this slide, so I draw one Q curve, uh, the one in red, and I point it to three points. One is below the resonant frequency, one at the resonant frequency, and then above the resonant frequency. Right. So in terms of the normalized switching frequency, it's less than one and one and higher than one. Yeah. Now, to your question, if I 
explain each one of them into three modes as listed. If I start at the resonant frequency where fs equal to fr, yeah. or in other words, fx is equal to one, you can see that my gain is equal to one. Yeah. And in terms of the operation, this is the best efficiency point to work at. That's a point the nominal design is designed around. So mm -hmm. in terms of the nominal input voltage and output voltage as well. But since your input voltage has a range that could go up and down beyond the nominal voltage, your converter or in this case, the tank has to operate in a boost gain or a buck gain. Mm, okay. okay. If you're required to go in a boost gain and that where you have to go to the left of your resonant point, and this is lower switching frequency. On the other side, if you want to go to a gain less than one or what we call a buck gain, your switching frequency has to increase higher and higher. Mm. Now, each of those points, if I'm working below or above the resonant frequency or point, it's their different operation modes, different waveforms, and different losses. Okay, um, Sam, can you walk me through the waveforms for each of these modes? Okay, so if we started the resonant operation, which is switching frequency equal to the resonant frequency, in this case, the resonant period is exactly equal to the switching period, meaning that my resonant sinusoidal waveform will finish its resonant at the time where the switching frequency is also finished or ready to switch to the second half. Gotcha. Okay. And this is one half and the second half it's also the same thing the current will resonate and complete its full resonance in the negative direction in this mode you could see that the diode current or the rectifier current gets to zero at the point where the primary switch s1 is turned off yeah at the same moment yeah if we move above the resonance operation fs larger than FR. Yeah. When we say FS is larger, that means that the switching period is smaller, right? Uh, right. Meaning that the resonant waveform or the resonance will not complete its sinusoidal cycle mm -hmm. until we get interrupted by another switching period. So if you look at the ILR, the sinusoidal current does not get to zero or does not finish its full resonance before we start a second half. And right. similarly on the diode current, ID1 and ID2, they start at zero, but they don't end at zero. We yeah. just interrupt that sinusoidal waveforms. Now, below the resonance operation, FS less than FR, yeah. we see that the switching period is much longer than the resonant operation. Right. If we look at ID1 and ID2, we finish the resonance and then we have some extra time there. Yeah. In that mode, the diode current still have a soft switching operation, but the primary side does have, because of that discontinuous operation or that extra time, we have an extra circulating current and extra conduction losses in that mode. Each of these modes have different equations and behaviors in terms of losses, uh, concerns of power loss in the devices as well. Okay, let's back up here a little bit and, and walk me through this. So what are the steps to start my design? Okay, if we go in a simple design guidelines, I mean, the first thing we need to do is to plot the curves for different Q for some initial M value that we design that okay. we can optimize as a second iteration or third iteration of the design steps. But if we, in this example, we say MX equal to six, right? Yeah. And I plot the gain with switch and frequency for different Q curves. The first step is I know what's the maximum gain my converters needs. So mm -hmm. I have to map that on the Y axis or on that plot. And then as I do this, I have to find what's maximum Q curve that can meet that gain. And okay. in that specific plot, I can see that the pink one just touched that gain. So that pink or that Q curve is going to be my maximum load curve. And I cannot operate or make the design operate at any higher Q 
Q value. For example, you cannot operate at the curves below, which is a blue one, the mm -hmm. cyan. Yeah. So I'm only allowed to operate at the green and dark blue and the red curves. That's boundary for me. Okay. And then once I know that Q curve, I found its peak and that will be my limited minimum switching frequency that I set from the controller side. Okay. And then on the other side of the resonant frequency, I also have to set my maximum switching frequency and that's for reasons of high switching frequency. It's not beneficial or practical to operate at one megahertz to regulate your output voltage because that's lose a lot of switching losses. There are other means to step down the voltage gain or the output voltage just like an example of pulse skipping, which is used in these controllers. Okay, so why did you pick six as your value for M? Why not one or 10? Okay, selection the M value, as mentioned, it's the M value is LR plus M divided by LR. Right. It's a design parameter that we start by fixing that and then it does not change with the operation. Mm -hmm. There is a trade-off between small M and high M. If you look at this slide I included three design or gain curves for m equal 3, m equal 6, and 12 for the same Q values. And the observation you could easily see that if I go to a higher m value, my Q curves get slower. Yeah. Right? So in that sense, m3 actually get me the higher boost curves, mm. meaning that as I reduce my M value, I can get higher boost gains ah. out of my resonant tank. So this is one benefit at M3 that's actually required in a wide input range applications that require you to step up the gain very high. But when M is very low, that has a side effect of higher magnetizing circulating current and mm. that impact the efficiency. Sure. So from efficiency point of view, the ideal case that I like to operate at very high M value. Mm -hmm. But from a flexibility of regulation, I cannot do that. I cannot run at M equal to 10 or 20 or 30 in some cases. Yeah. So I have to bring it down to get me my boost gain required by the specs of the converter or the input voltage range. Okay, so we're working on the resonant tank. Give me some guidelines on what to use for the secondary rectifier. Okay, so as mentioned, the LLC, one benefit that the resonant tank could be implemented to be excited by a primary bridge to be a half bridge or a full bridge, mm -hmm. okay? And each has its pluses and minuses, and each application is different. Of course, the half bridge has only two switches or only two MOSFETs, and that's favorable from a cost point of view. In some cases, the input current is very high or the power level are very high. Mm -hmm. The full bridge could deliver the power with less RMS current in the primary side, and you know that leads to a lower conduction losses. So one criteria is in a high input current or a high primary current or high power value, the full bridge might be at some point the way to move from a half bridge to full bridge gotcha. design. Okay. On the secondary rectifier, the two options are commonly full bridge or a full wave. Again, a full bridge requires four devices and the full wave is only two devices. But the full wave, those devices voltage rating has to be twice the output voltage. Mm, okay. So if the design is for 400 volts at the output, that's a reason to use a full bridge so that you can use a diode of 600 volts. If you use a full wave, then the stress on the diode will be twice mm. the 400 and that's 800. And then you are forced to use a 1200 volts devices right. and that's something you know always related to the losses the cost what's available in semiconductors and the performance of devices in a low voltage smps or adapter application like a 12 volts of course we use a full wave and synchronous rectifiers and the main reason is we only need two devices versus a full bridge and current is passing through only two devices rather than four, so it's beneficial from a losses point of view. 
that makes sense. Okay, so we put a lot of unique requirements into our controller in this design. Do you have a controller that can do all of this for me? Yes, the LLC controller has a different requirement or set of required features from a PWM controller like a flyback or a half bridge controller or a full bridge controller because of some required protection features or regulation features like what we know that's related to the switch and frequency. Yeah. Infineon offers the ICE2 HS resonant mode controller that designed specifically for satisfying that topology. If we go on the feature set of this controller, it provides a flexibility and adjusting frequency for setting the minimum and maximum switch and frequency, and then the overcurrent protection and the soft start. In overcurrent and soft start, it's also a function that's controlling the oscillator. Mm. Because if you remember the gains and the power we deliver to the secondary or the impedance of that resonant tank, is a function of the frequency. Yeah. So if you, I want to limit the power delivery or the primary current, the way to do this is we increase switch and frequency, and that's different from the PWM converters. That's why the OCP uh, and the soft start is directly controlling the oscillator. Also, that control is capable of one megahertz switch and frequency. Even if the converter is not running at one megahertz, in a soft start and OCP operation, we are required to go to a much higher switch and frequency mm. for that. One other very important benefit of this controller is the synchronous rectification signals that controller can provide. We'll explain that in a second. Also, there is other protection function that could be implemented like the over temperature protection and open load and overload protection as well. So if I just go quickly on the frequency oscillator, the frequency oscillator is controlling more than one parameter. It controls the minimum operating frequency to avoid running into the capacitive mode. It also sets the maximum switching frequency to optimize the converter efficiency and avoid running into a very high switching frequency and increase switching losses. It also sets the soft start frequency. When we turn on the converter to limit the inrush current and the high current spikes in the resonant tank, the controller must command a very high switching frequency mm. at start and then ramp down to the steady state. Right. normal switch in frequency and if I detect an incident where uh, I have an overcurrent the way to protect it is to jump or step up the switch in frequency so that what the main functions of the frequency oscillator is minimum and maximum frequency setting and also soft start and OCP frequency okay and another function is of course, we sense the current signal from the primary. The controller has three levels of current protection. Again, the main command if to limit the current is increasing the switch and frequency. So we have a threshold. If we increase the threshold of level one, we increase the switch and frequency. If we reach a higher threshold, then we increase it more. And then the third level is it goes into a latch. That's the highest protection that if you increase, you shut down your PWM signals. Okay. And then the SR control, as mentioned, is one main feature of this device. And it's very complicated for resonant controllers. And this specific controller uses a predefined on time for the synchronous rectifier signals and also fine-tuned by some current adaptive control that's related to the current sense on the primary side to provide the best efficiency in the most protected SR driving. Okay, Sam, how does that work? I don't quite get it. What makes SR a challenging issue? If you look into this slide, this sums like the three operation modes we talked about previously. But the synchronous rectifier, the rectifier on the secondary side was shown as diodes. But if we want to replace those rectifiers, diode by switches, MOSFETs for conduction losses reasons, then we must provide a driving signal that's mm. on when you have a current in that rectifier and then you turn it off 
when that current goes to zero. Yeah. So if we look at the three operational modes and we look at the diode current, if you look at the first two, which is Fs equal to Fr, and then at Fs higher than Fr, in, yeah. in both of those two modes, if you compare the ID1 with the primary signal of S1, you can see that I could derive the SR signal based on S1, or I can say that the secondary driving or secondary synchronous rectifier gate signal is in sync with the primary side signal. Yeah. Which is simple, which is the case in PWM. That's how it's done with some time tuning and time delays to accommodate for other propagation delays. But if I look at the third mode, which is FS less than FR, you can see that ID1 finishes its resonance way before I turn off the primary signal or the signal S1. Mm -hmm. In this mode, you cannot drive the synchronous rectifier or send an on-time relevant to S1. You have to turn off the synchronous rectifier as soon as the ID1 current goes to zero or the rectifier current goes to zero on the secondary side. And that's what the controller mechanism does is it detects which mode you are in and it says if you are in the mode where fs less than fr then you drive the synchronous rectifier based on the resonant mode period yeah if you are in the other two modes which is the fs equal fr and fs larger than the fr then you drive the gates of srs or the secondary signals based on the primary signals mm, okay we distinguish that by sensing the bus voltage and compare it to some threshold to make that distinguishing. Each of those modes, like the mode where FS less than FR, it's ID1 or the synchronous rectifier signal is driven with an on time that's predetermined in the controller, but also fine-tuned in adaptive manner with the current sense current. Mm -hmm. So I could set it to be two micros, right? And then yeah. I could add 200 or 300 nano in relative to the load condition of the whole converter for further optimization and efficiency benefit. Okay, so what else does it do? Well, one of the protection functions is the overload. And it's also in the same sense does the open load. So in both condition, overload or open load, what happens is the output voltage goes down or if it's an open load meaning that i'm not sensing my output voltage something disconnected in my feedback loop my open load signal is high yeah. after i pass it through some optocoupler and if i detect that high signal after some blanking time 20 millisecond in this case then it will do some action and turn off the primary signals and then will restart when it recovers with a soft start again. And then the other function is a burst mode operation or the pulse skipping. And this is a mode where we run for a few cycles, we turn off for some time and then we run again. This signal we can enable it or disable it in the control based on the user preference. Okay, and, and why would we need burst mode? Yes, in burst mode, if you remember the gain curves in the operation beyond the resonant frequency, at some point we limited the maximum switching frequency in the controller because yeah. we said we don't want to go to 1 megahertz because that will reduce our efficiency at 1 megahertz. So we might just set the maximum switching frequency to 500 kilohertz and then at light load or some condition that where I need to step down the gain, I will not rely only on increasing the switch and frequency. I will rely on this as a second way to reduce my gain. Gotcha. Okay. So what does one of these look like in a typical design? This is a basic configuration of how this could be implemented in a typical way. Of course, there is too many variation of how this could be implemented, but this shows a typical 
primary, secondary driving schemes and how the protection and the feedback loop would look like but we do have two reference designs for an LLC for different applications okay the first one is a solar microinverter and this was specifically targeted to the MPPT stage which is a front end on the panel side for a DC to DC okay so taking the input voltage of the panel which is in the range of 30 volts and boosting up to the bus voltage of 400 volts Okay. And in the range of 250 watts for a single panel operation. For this one, switching frequency was set to be 110 kilohertz as a resonant point, but it could go to a minimum of 50 and a maximum of 190. Okay. So I see you've got a picture here. Is this a board you actually built? Yes, actually this is one, again, it was targeted for this specific application and it was built over the primary MOSFETs of 60 volts and low RDS on because this is a high current on the primary side and the primary was a full bridge circuit. So Sam, show us the schematic. Yeah, there is a document that includes the detail of that design with the schematics and all the waveforms and the bill of material. There is some waveforms that shows the operation at the different three modes at the resonant operation and showing the ZVS condition and below the resonance like at a very low V input mm -hmm. and then higher than the resonance at the high V input which is 36 volts in this case and it shows the all modes have the zero voltage switching also one as shown in this light load uh, missing cycle mode this is a function of the controller that before it gets into the burst mode it misses two out of three cycles as a way of stepping down the gain to a 0.5 or so so this is a first level of pulse skipping if the load gets lighter it goes into a real pulse skipping as well ah okay yeah and this is the efficiency of that design shown at different power levels and input voltage Cool, okay. So, Sam, do you got a second example by chance? Yes. The second example is for the common switch mode power supply converters, and this is a 400 volts input to 12 volts output, 300 watts. And this was built with a primary MOSFETs of 600 volts cool MOS and secondary synchronous rectifiers, 40 volts voltage class low RDS on of course and such application where you have the high current on the secondary side this is the application or the case where you need the synchronous rectifiers and therefore you need the synchronous rectification driving capability from the controller that we talked about and this board is actually available right yes and this one is also the application note of that board and the board itself is available and it includes all the design guidelines, schematics, and other details and waveforms as well. Cool, okay. So show me what this looks like in a schematic. So this one is the board of the SMPS. We see it's implemented with the primary side of half bridge, and the secondary side is a full wave rectifier with a synchronous rectification. Okay. And then here shows some of the waveforms of the soft start. In the soft start, as mentioned, to limit the inrush current, the converter starts at a very high switch in frequency. We can see that the V output signal does not have a spike and it's smoothly ramp up to the steady state or to the voltage that we wish to regulate to. Yeah. And then the next uh, slide shows a burst mode operation at no load condition. You see the V output as it goes down slowly to some point we add a new burst of or few cycles of power delivery mm -hmm. brings the V output higher again and then the same cycle goes on and on. Okay. And there is a switch in our, the efficiency table and the data for this converter and one point to look at here is achieving 97.5% including the controller and driving power at 50% that's a very high number and Another benefit is looking at the 5% and 10% of the load region. And this is a benefit we mentioned at the start where LLC, the fact it maintains the soft switching at the light load, mm -hmm. that's what gets it achieve a high efficiency at the very light conditions. 
Okay, Sam, I think I'm ready to get started. Uh, where should I go for more information? This slide highlights the main references. There is a lot of references on Fenian website, but the two boards we talked about, the cover page of their application notes are just shown here, and they're referenced as one and two. And there is also a reference three, which is a very good document for design guide of the LLC converter with the Infineon controller IC. These are available on the website and they include a lot of educational material and the material related to the reference design. Fantastic. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me and talking with me today, Sam. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you for having me. Before we go, don't forget to click that link there. You can download several application notes that further expand on this topic. For Chalk Talk, I'm Amelia Dalton. For more Chalk Talks, check out the on-demand section of eejournal.com.